All right. Good evening, AP Language and Composition Scholars. Welcome to your very first flipped classroom. And uh, this is on sentence style and why it's important. I just thought rather than taking some class time for it, we could do it quickly this way. So there's a student who says, I don't see how sentence structure is needed to know vocabulary. Okay, really it's not. I just figured since there are all those sentences within our vocabulary books, we can have these quick little mini lessons on sentence types fairly easily rather than doing a bunch of worksheets and uh, labeling the sentences as simple and compound and complex and compound complex and that kind of thing. If you know about sentence type and style, and why and how writers use those, hopefully you will apply them to your own writing and make your writing stronger and see how different types of sentences can have an effect on the reader. So moving on, uh, syntax, it has two purposes. It can build meaning and it can help you with your purpose. So good writers make decisions about syntax because they know that when you put your words in a certain order and when you use certain types of sentences, you can achieve certain effects with the readers. And you'll see what I mean as we continue through this. Strong syntax helps writers establish their credibility and you can also really have an impact on how the readers are feeling as they listen to the speech. So there are times for long sentences, there are times for short sentences, there are times when it is helpful to invert the traditional structure, and times when um, you want to be giving imperative sentences, giving commands, of course, um, exclamatory sentences that's really obvious that those are to build excitement and so on and so forth anyway some simple things syntax if we just take a look at this first of all it's the arrangement of words into phrases clauses and sentences so what you want to think about is the word order in English traditionally we go subject verb object or subject verb complement um, don't worry about the prepositional phrases and the adjectives and adverbs, just the main parts. The other way you can do is inverted word order. You know, Yoda speak, hungry I was. Well, why would you do something like that if you're not Yoda? Um, to draw attention to that adjective and to just draw attention to your words because our ears are going to perk up and say, wait a second, what did they just say and why did they say it that way? So a couple of different reasons there. Um, syntax also involves the length and the structure of sentences. This is where we can look at the simple compound complex, compound complex. If you have too many of the compound complex sentences in a row as the reader is listening, they're lulled into not paying attention. Whereas if you have a lot of short, direct, simple sentences, um, they are more likely to have an impact and keep keep the speech moving along as well. Uh, so that can be helpful. And schemes, we'll continue to talk about these. I don't think we've really touched on any of these yet. Parallelism, juxtaposition, antithesis, and antimetaboly. All right, so some great terms we'll get to. Um, so you have, as a writer, some decisions to make. We are going to be focusing next on the argument once we finish up with this little bit on rhetorical analysis. Right now we're looking at how writers write, then we'll be putting it into practice after we've analyzed all these different speeches and texts. So you can do a normal word order, you can invert it, you can also break it up. You know those great sentences that have a a portion and they have a dash, have a little bit of information there, they have a dash and continue on. That can be effective at times to draw your attention to certain things. Uh, type or structure of sentence, I think you know what this is, you know the simple compound complex, compound complex. Length of sentence, if you think back to reading The Scarlet Letter in 10th grade with Mrs. Walter probably, um, Hawthorne, he consistently used these lengthy sentences and uh, it's not always the most interesting to read sentence after sentence like that. And yet that's just the style that they used to write in. 
passive or active voice? This is something I need to find out if everybody is solid on this. Um, I do have a slide on it coming up. Style of sentence that I'm thinking that's going to be newer information. I have a slide coming up on that. And then schemes. This is where uh, you really show off your sophistication as a writer. So uh, this, this is my quick review. We went over this with our vocab books. So you can pause this video and go through and look at it. I'm not going to take a lot of time to go through those again. Length of sentences. If you want to build up to something, you can have this long flowing sentence and then boom, put the punch at the end. Or if you want readers or listeners to take notice, those short sentences sometimes um, make it feel more action packed. So think about whether or not the sentences are telegraphic you know, like a telegram where you got charged for every single word, so you kept it as short as possible. If they're just normally short, five to 12 words, medium or long and involved, you know, Hawthorne-esque. All right, so to better understand the value of sentence length, read this passage, then read it out loud. Okay, I'm gonna read it. Gary Provost on the rhythms of sentence length. This sentence has five words. This is five words too. Five word sentences are fine, but several together become monotonous. Listen to what is happening. The writing is getting boring. The sound of it drones. It's like a stuck record. The ear demands some variety. Now listen, I vary the sent sentence length and I create music. Music, the writing sings. It has a pleasant rhythm, a lilt, to harmony. I use short sentences and I use sentences of medium length and sometimes when I am certain the reader is rested, I will engage him with a sentence of considerable length, a sentence that burns with energy and builds with all the impetus of a crescendo, the roll of the drums, the crash of the cymbals, and sounds that say, listen to this. It is important. So, I think that's cool. That's a neat way to look at it. All right, maybe this will take you back to excuse me, some middle school worksheets where you have to look at active voice, passive voice. Active voice is used to make bold statements about who is doing what to whom. Passive voice is used to disguise or withhold that sense of urgency. Oh, it just happened. Um, I like this in Spanish when you forget something. Me escapó. It escaped me. It's not your fault. It's not I forgot. It's whatever I was trying to remember escaped me. So you don't get the blame. So unless you really want to have a particular effect, usually we say avoid passive voice. It adds verbosity because you have to lengthen the sentence by explaining who's doing what. So. Um, here, active versus passive. He kicked the bucket viciously. The bucket was kicked by the boy. So you see what I mean um, by the boy. That prepositional phrase has to get added on to clarify. The dog bit the head off of the rat. The rat's head was bitten off by the dog. There's a time and place for both, depending just what you want to emphasize. So moving on. Um, this is where I don't think you'd probably know this. Maybe when you're writing, not just what type of sentence, simple, compound, complex, compound, complex, but what style. So there is a cumulative sentence also called a loose sentence. I have both of those terms on your rhetoric packet of terms, periodic, balanced or interrupted. I think balanced and interrupted are pretty well self-explanatory, you know, balanced the elements are equal and interrupted is like I talked about before with the dashes, but I'll have some examples. So cumulative or loose sentences. This is where you have a sentence and you have then the details added on to it. So basic Abraham Lincoln wept, cumulative or loose Abraham Lincoln wept, fearing that the union would not survive if the southern states seceded. So you get the most important thing out there in the front, and then you can see what the result was, what the repercussions were, or have some more descriptive adjectives that give more information, but you've got that most important thing there in the foreground. Okay.
can, um, a little bit more about it, you can build parallel constructions after main clause, which is kind of nice, like a number of phrases that end with ing. Uh, you're following the, the very traditional pattern of subject verb, so it, it seems like it makes sense to our ears. It gives away the sentence secret right away at the beginning, though. So if somebody is skimming a text, they're going to say, oh, that's what I need, and skip all that beautiful wording that was worked on. And if you have a number of those, it just might become monotonous. So looking at periodic sentences, this is where the details are placed before the basic sentence elements. Again, Abraham Lincoln wept. Now here, you're building up to that. So alone in his study, lost in somber thoughts about his beloved country, dejected but not broken in spirit. <gasps> What's going on? What's going on? Abraham Lincoln wept. Okay, so it carries tension, it continues the interest through, the emphasis is delayed until the very end. Why use a periodic sentence? You're delaying that idea till the end, so somebody has to read everything you have, so they're following through to get the main idea. So it should hold the reader's attention and give suspense, but again, if you use a whole bunch of these in a row, it might become confusing. So I guess the behind the scenes kind of point I'm making here is vary your sentence types because that makes it more interesting for your readers. All right, so balanced sentences. Two parallel clauses or phrases are set off against each other. Faulkner's imagery is richly evocative, but his syntax is often opaque. So just a compound sentence is a good example of this. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. So there's this feeling of here we have this and here we have this. This is good too if you are presenting a counter argument and refuting it. This is a great sentence style to use. So a lot of times when somebody uses this type of balanced sentence, the reader or the listener kind of has this pause between, aha, there's this and this. If you have antithesis, that becomes very effective when you have two opposite items, and you can really emphasize contrast this way. So it supports your point. It's quite witty. Um, antithesis, in case you're not really familiar with this term that I'm throwing around, it's a juxtaposition of contrasting words or ideas. So place your virtues on a pedestal, put your vices under a rock. So virtues and Vices are contrasted, and then a pedestal and under a rock are contrasted. So it's a really cool technique. We'll see it lots of times in people's speeches. Okay, interrupted sentences. Subordinate elements come in the middle. Usually you have dashes. These students, selfish, deceitful, and sadistic, sadistic were evident of their parents' muddled values. The teacher, what could he have been thinking? gave all the students A's on the exam. So it creates this halted rhythm. It gives you some emphasis. It's kind of cool. It's a nice thing. Parallel structure, just a, a little bit about this. Maybe I should have put my slides in a different order. Hmm? Um, when a passage, a paragraph, or a sentence contains two or more ideas that are fulfilling a similar function, the writer who wants to sound measured, deliberate, and balanced will express those ideas in the same grammatical forms. Uh, this is probably something some of you had in middle school grammar. If you want to have effective writing, you use parallelism. Words balance words, phrases balance phrases, clauses balance clauses, and sentence balance sentences. So what does this look like? He loved swimming, running, and playing tennis. Notice that ing form, ing form, ing form. Exercise physiologists argue that body pump aerobic sessions benefit a person's heart and lungs, muscles and nerves, joints and cartilage. So here we have pairings of nouns, pairings of words basically. So a nice balance there. Phrases balance phrases. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln at Gettysburg. So prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase, and how powerful is that? Um, Lauren Isley, Unexpected Universe here. Man, for all his daylight activities, is at best an evening creature. 
our every addiction to the day and our compulsion manifests through the ages to invent and use illuminating devices, to contest with midnight, to cast off sleep as we would death, suggests that we know more of the shadows than we are willing to recognize. So here it's not prepositional phrases, it's these infinitive phrases. Sometimes people just say, oh yeah, that's two plus a verb in the present tense. So again, another way to have that parallel structure. Clauses, balance clauses. I don't know if any of you are familiar with All Creatures Great and Small, James Harriet. He's got a number of books. Uh, there used to be a PBS show. My sister watched it. Anyway, I'd always marveled at the Bellerbees. They seemed to me to be survivors from another age, and their world had a timeless quality. They were never in a hurry. They rose when it was light, went to bed when they were tired, ate when they were hungry and seldom looked at a clock. So here's this repetition of clauses. When it was light, when they were tired, when they were hungry. All dependent clauses. And even if they are short, independent clauses, that provides this balance. Now in speaking like this, it doesn't mean that we're anti-exploitation, we're anti-degradation, we're anti-oppression. And if the white man doesn't want us to be anti-him, let him stop oppressing and exploiting and degrading us, Malcolm X. So here, um, this is a independent clause. We're anti-exploitation. Here's another independent clause that can stand alone. We're anti-degradation. We're anti-oppression. And then here we also have the parallel um, expression with these verbals, oppressing, exploiting, degrading. So parallelism in a number of different ways in that example. Carl Sagan from Cosmos, they remind us that humans have evolved to wonder, that understanding is a job, that knowledge is a pre, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, prerequisite to survival. Okay, so here we have dependent clauses again, that humans have evolved to wonder. That understanding is a job. That knowledge is a prerequisite to survival. And uh, notice that in two of them, we also have an infinitive phrase at the end of it. So just a nice little feature. So sentence, sentences balance sentences. Don't knock parallelism. It sings. It excites. It works. So there we have a number of sentences that all correspond. Short, simple, sweet. There you have it. Hope that helps you understand how your sentences can have a big impact on how your ideas are conveyed.